Okay, so I heard that you're still focused on the visual stuff, and, uh, and now at the end of the day, let's move on, okay? So today we're gonna look at more sound-related things. So my background is in math and graphics and robotics, but we're gonna look at uh, sound and sound generation to basically finish the, the job of, of computer animation and, and visual modeling. Um, so uh, this is work with a, a bunch of my students at, at, at Cornell as well as here at Stanford. So I've moved here uh, just three years ago. And so I wanna thank them. Um, so just as a summary, the kind of work that, that I'm gonna talk about um, has to do with audiovisual modeling of physical systems. So you could think of them, uh, you know, like for things in animations like water or solids, or you could think of it like a, you know, a cell phone or, you know, a dishwasher if you're in, 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 in that space. Um, and so there's a lot of aspects of modeling these things. And then I'm also gonna talk about some aspects of real-time simulation uh, not so much the technical details, I don't have time, uh, but a lot of these things, we've been doing real-time sound for you know, almost two decades now, so these have obvious applications in things like VR and games. Uh, and then the last part of my talk, I'm gonna talk about integrated sound synthesis. So if you had a, if you had a system that could render anything, what would it be? And, and we wanna really understand how can we solve the rendering problem for graphics and, and also for sound. And there's a lot of applications that this touches on that I'm not gonna talk about. One area that I'm really excited about is robot sound for manipulation and, and sensing uh, and all kinds of other things that involve sound. Okay, so a lot of my work uh, in, in computer graphics has, has to do with simulating deformable systems, things like cloth. Here's yarn level systems of cloth that we're doing to model textiles and other, other new fabric designs. Uh, other things I'm really excited about are algorithms for simulating things really fast. So here's like a simulation from 14 years ago uh, that ran in a Java applet because the system was 100 times faster than the previous methods. Um, here's uh, some work I've done at Pixar on uh, making interactive deformable sculpting brushes based on analytical solutions of elasticity. Uh, so this is really important for being able to allow artists to sculpt uh, plausible deformations of characters interactively without uh, collapsing artifacts and other, other things like this. Um, and I'm also interested in touch, haptic rendering, coupling with robots, how can you uh, evaluate things really quickly, simulate, you know, resolve collisions, evaluate contact forces, simulate deformation, things like that when you only have a millisecond budget. Uh, and so the other area that I'm going to focus on today is about sound. So, uh, oh, something's wrong with the sound. You know, that's the big joke, right? Oh, th there's no sound here. Sorry, the speakers are underneath you, you know. Um, so how do we actually uh, compute these things? So I like the joke that all of computer graphics and animation is basically a silent movie. Uh, it's basically like a, you know, a repeat of what happened 100 years ago where uh, we found ways to make pictures come on the screen, but sound was always an afterthought. And it seems like that just keeps happening. It's like, oh yeah, sound is actually important. People go to VR, they put on a headset, and they say, oh, the sound sucks, what do we do now, right? So uh, the same sort of things uh, keep happening. So if we really wanted to solve this rendering problem, we'd have to figure out for every disturbance that we're modeling geometrically or physically, how does it accelerate the air around it? And how does this disturbance then radiate and basically get convolved with your head? And so this is the rendering problem that we'd like to be able to, to, to delve deeper into. Uh, so here's some different phenomena that we've looked at over the years. Uh, the basic problems are, how do we model different phenomena? Okay, so like water, solids, fracture, characters. And then how do we come up with algorithms that you know, can be evaluated efficiently on modern hardware and, uh, and explore applications of that? So there's a whole bunch of different things that we've looked at. I'll just show you a few of them. Uh, so here, one of the sort of bread and butter uh, you know, models is just a, a solid object, like a rigid object, which isn't really rigid. It's got some rigid modes of vibration, uh, and vibration modes, and it also has some rigid body accelerations. And together we can model these motions to get sounds like this. Can you turn that up a bit? I'll just play that again. Uh, we've looked at other effects like uh, chaos and, and, and nonlinear effects that cause more noisy sounds instead of ringing sounds. Hopefully nobody's getting hurt by the sound. 
Uh, we've looked at fracture, so when you take a system and destroy it, it cascades into a whole bunch of other, a tree structure cascade of sound models. Each of these are rigid parts. Uh, we've looked at combustion effects. And in each of these, we take a physics-based approach to model it in some consistent way with the underlying physics and then make approximations for speed or pre-compute things so we can make models that run in real time or fast enough that we can evaluate hundreds or hundreds of thousands or millions of steps. We've looked at coupling between objects when you have a chattering or vibrating system. You, if you ignore them and treat objects rigidly, you, you don't get this coupling when, in fact, if you pound on the table, you know, you get all this chatter. Uh, Small objects are interesting because they don't vibrate at frequencies you can hear. So if you take tiny objects like keys or marbles and tap them together, you're often hearing the rigid body acceleration due to the contacts. Uh, so if you throw dice on the table, you basically only hear the table with a, a modal sound model. But real there's also the dice that you're missing. And so these kind of a things are really important for capturing all this brightness when you smash China on the floor to get all of the, all of the frequency content. Uh, we've also looked at ways to reason about sound uh, and motion. So if you, if you just hear a sound of an object thrown on the ground and you know the object, what motion did the object undergo? We built machine learning tools to estimate motion from just sound, which is a pretty under-constrained problem, but you can still do it. Here's the sound clip at the bottom that the robot hears, and the, the times and the amplitudes of those events. And then this is basically what the robot dreams. So there's no need to build a garlic simulator in this case. You can just take the sound and then find motion that matches it. So this, we generated a lot of motion. There's actually a half hour of footage on the, of all the stuff the, the computer dreamed up. Uh, we've also looked at systems that are really challenging because of just how many contacts they have. Here's a slinky that pours down the stairs. And we discretize it. We basically end up with billions of collision events that we have to resolve that produce the sound. A lot of these rapid impacts and also ringing of the coils produce the characteristic slinky sound. Um, here's, a, here's a slow motion depiction with the waveform below. So you can see every time it hits the stairs, it has a large impact. And then there are these you know, innumerable numbers of contacts within every graphics frame uh, and within every little sound frame window. And so with a system like this, we can actually hope to model complicated mechanisms, machinery, drive a virtual car in the future, and actually hear everything that would be present if we actually built it. Here's the actual sound. And it actually has the same ringing frequency that a real slinky does. OK, so one really challenging problem that we've been excited about for a long time is actually being able to render water visually as well as acoustically. And this is hard for so many, so many reasons, which are interesting that I can't tell you about right now. Um, one of the first things we did was look at just single phase water. So just, just like a typical graphic simulation that only models the water, ignores the air, no bubbles. And then we hallucinated bubbles based on some distribution. Every bubble vibrates at some frequency, which causes the fluid to vibrate, which causes sound waves to come off it. So the, Water is basically like a shape-changing loudspeaker that's vibrating in some funny way as it moves around because of these bubbles. So this is our first attempt in 2009.
And it captures a lot of the different characteristics of it, but it's essentially a parody. Uh, one of the problems is it, it doesn't really know about all the details of the, of the two-phase phenomena. So in the follow-up work in 2016, two years ago, we looked at a system that if we actually computed water to like some sub-millimeter accuracy and captured the two-phase phenomena, all the bubbles pinching off, splitting, merging, popping, and where they were and what shapes they were, what would the sound be? And so we have improved models of, of each of those bubble vibrations and how they actually radiate. And this is still an approximation, uh, but it's, it's, it's an improvement. So while this captures all the synchronization with all of the visual events, it's fundamentally band limited because every bubble has a fairly narrow range. Basically, it sounds like some AM radio version of water. Uh, and all of the frequencies of the bubbles determine the amplitude based on a single frequency radiation model, which fundamentally misses all of these subtle time domain scattering events that you hear, like echoes in the tank. And so more recently, we have a totally different pipeline for basically rendering everything. And we ran water through it, and it just, the first result was basically this. It sounds like something you might actually drink. Okay, so the fundamental problem with sound rendering methods that we've been doing and that the whole community, I think, has been doing is that they lack integration. They're not actually solving the general problem. They're not a rendering uh, system, essentially. Every type of thing you want to do, water or rigid bodies or modal solids or fracture or noise models, they're all separate. And part of the reason is that it's so expensive to do sound, far more expensive than physics or you know, just visual stuff. Because you have you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of time steps, and all of this stuff is expensive, it's space-time complexity. So we would try to pre-compute things to make it faster, or come up with these you know, phenomena-specific models. The end of the day is everything's balkanized. Everybody's got their own simulator for every different separate thing, and none of the waves can interact. And so because of that, you, it's hard to render a general, a, a general set, setting. And so as motivation, go back to 1983 and think about the Ray's rendering architecture. This was a system where the hope was that you could build a system that would be able to render general visual phenomena, right? And the, the hope was, back at you know, Lucasfilm, was that it may be really slow, but let's build a system that could actually render one frame with all the stuff we want that they could do at the time, and enough resolution that such that if we could do this for every frame, we would actually be able to render a whole movie, okay? So the system was so slow, they rendered just one frame, okay? And then that led to the paper, you know, a one frame movie, right? But the hope is it's general enough that you could actually generalize this if you have faster hardware, et cetera. So what we wanted to do is build a system that would allow us to render any sound phenomena for any animation. And that's what this paper that we are going to publish this summer at SIGGRAPH uh, attempts to do, with, albeit with a, a very simple system approach. Uh, and so the basic idea is to build a general purpose wave solver that will allow arbitrary animated interfaces and vibrating interfaces to, to drive the sound. And so it can be a symbol, it could be water, it could be a smashing toaster, whatever. And the system is general enough that it'll actually be able to compute that sound for you. So whether you're you know, an iPhone manufacturer or you know, an appliance manufacturer or a movie producer, whatever, we don't care, it'll render it. And so this is the, this is the aspiration. And next, we need to focus on how to make it, make it faster. Um, but here's the water from the previous approach. You can see basically the frequencies of the bubbles. It's very band limited. That's why it would sound so harsh. And the new approach fundamentally captures a wide range of frequencies and content that was just missing before, but was in the simulation data that's driving the waves. So here are some examples. This is a, a really cheap like Walmart symbol, single thickness, nothing special, that we uh, model with two thicknesses. And so here you can see the actual waves that are being modeled and generated. So 
The simulation is one way coupled to the surrounding acoustic medium, and it can be time stepped in, in parallel uh, throughout the domain. But you have a lot of time steps. That's the basic problem here. You may have hundreds of thousands of time steps that you have to do. So it's basically like graphics where you're basically rendering the wave equation, except you have more colors. You have only two pixels, but the frame rate is really, really high. Uh, here's an example of a rigid body. So typically, we just model the rigid body object separately, apply the forces to it, get the sound out. But there would be no scattering and time varying interactions with the floor, because that's really expensive to capture. Uh, so before you'll hear, the first one you'll hear just the example without the floor. And then this involves scattering off the floor. And notice that you capture a fundamental Helmholtz resonance as the cavity gets smaller and smaller. This has been validated with cheap uh, bowls. Okay, so one trick we have for rendering this, if you want to render a movie, the problem with sound is that it's serial inherently. You have to time step this wave equation to get the waves to go forward. And if you have a lot of time steps, like a million time steps, this is a pretty bad space to be in for parallelism, right? You have parallelism across your domain. The resolution is pretty modest, maybe hundreds of cells, cubic cells. 100 by 100 by 100 or something, uh, but you have a long time integration. Um, so what we do is we can take the accelerations, uh, boundary accelerations that are driving the domain, and split the boundary conditions uh, across uh, multiple windows. And this, this decomposition is, is, is perfectly straightforward to compute, but the key thing is because of linearity of the wave solution operator, we can map all of these excitations of the boundaries to uh, individual solutions, okay? And so all of these sound clips uh, basically are generated in a small region around the object. The waves rapidly leave the domain. So the amount of ringing is very small. We're not simulating cathedrals. We're simulating a bowl on a table, right? And, uh, and because of that, we can sum these up and have a, a map-reduced framework for sound synthesis that allows us to paralyze things across the cloud. Every node can run things on the GPU and be really fast. Uh, our current implementation doesn't have GPU parallelism, but we just ran it on the cloud, and it just, just worked. Um, so there's a lot of applications this allows now. One of the applications that I'm excited about is 3D automatic dialogue replacement. Whenever you hear virtual characters in movies talking, it's somebody talking into a microphone and just paste it onto the audio track. But what you can do with this system is instead of having just uh, the audio play directly, you can run it through the virtual scene, include scattering, effects of people talking behind their hand or moving around. And you get this uh, for free, essentially. Well, not for free. You have to use this. But it, you can compute it. So here's before. A, B, C, D. And here's after. A, B, C, D. So you can re-render all your virtual characters and get uh, these sound effects. Uh, we did a whole bunch of examples in the paper. I don't have time. I'll just show you just this one with this bugle and also this fan example, which is kind of challenging. So here's uh, before and after. And this is a funny example. If you've ever talked into a fan and, and it makes a funny sound, this was the inspiration for this example. It also shows a really challenging domain. We're simulating sound in the space around the fan, but the fan is moving extremely rapidly at the end, but it still works fine. Luke, I am your father. OK. Okay, so that's a summary of, of the work we've been doing in sound synthesis. So if you're interested in any of this, I'd be happy to, to talk with you later. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Any questions? So I actually have a question to start things out. Um, okay. Earlier today, we saw um, 
a faculty member present about visualizing around corners, so using lasers in the application to um, autonomous vehicles. Do you see this as another way of sort of figuring out what's happening that you can't see around a corner that could be applied to something like autonomous vehicles? Um, I'm, I definitely think there's a lot of applications in sound for robotics and autonomous vehicles that, uh, that could be explored. I mean, we've, we've done some work on proposing different things in that space already. Um, I think for, for robots especially, a lot of robots are really dumb when it comes to sound. Um, you, know, you, you focus on listening to people and doing uh, speech recognition, but um, if you close your eyes, you can still navigate pretty effectively. You can understand what's happening around you. You can understand materials. You can understand events. If somebody rolls a landmine up behind you, you'll hear it. Um, so it's, I think it's an underexplored space. It's really also, I think, important for manipulation and uh, being able to understand what's happening uh, to what, you're, what you think is happening. Yeah. Hi, uh, we have seen equipment in the uh, real world that's making different sounds and people are trying to uh, detect and do predict maintenance. Our experienced technicians can listen to the sound the machine makes and then detect which parts of the machines wear out or is going to crack or fracture. Is it possible using uh, modeling and then we compare the sound we receive versus the one we expect, trying to then further deduct that whether machine needs maintenance or certain parts of the machine without breaking the machine and opening it up to detect whether parts of it is actually worn out? Yeah, I think a combination of data-driven and simulation-based inference would be useful for a lot of that. The challenging thing for, for understanding wear and, and failure is that um, if you don't know, you know, the ex, you know exactly how it's going to break, there's many different models that you may have to explore, and the expressiveness of the sound model could be quite large, depending on what the domain is. Um, but it's definitely, I think, important for, for design and also for, for maintenance and understanding. You can classify a wide range of, of sounds and, and get understanding. I mean, acoustic, acoustic uh, events, you don't have to do airborne sound either, right? S Structure-borne sound is really important. You know, not only tap on your head, but also, uh, you know, if you tap on a car or a wing of an aircraft, uh, you know, a lot of the methods for doing uh, failure analysis for aircraft wings are based on estimating two-point Green's function responses, and if there's a fracture, it's gonna change that, that influence matrix, and you can detect that. So there's a lot of ways to, to do that. So is there a way to detect uh, synthesized sound versus real sound, right? In a world of kind of fake news, you'd want to know who told what. So is there a way to separate the two? Right. So this has to do with uh, audio uh, forensics. And uh, there are, are methods to detect, um, you know, tampering of, of audio signals as well as, um, you know, synthesis artifacts. It's tricky. Uh, in sound design, for example, I know people at Industrial Light and Mad, uh, sorry, Skywalker Sound, who do um, a lot of synthesis for all kinds of different sounds. But the tricky thing uh, often is doing vocalizations. Um, and so, uh, you know, people that, that do sound effects for movies don't spend much time worrying about how to make a, you know, a ding or a bonk or some other, uh, you know, passive object sound. It's more about, like, how to synthesize sounds for you know, a new alien character or god or pixie or just some random other synthetic one. So if you can't use a voice directly, then it's often hard to fake it because of the complex, uh, you know, organic sort of nature of a lot of vocalizations. So um, fortunately, they're harder to fake. Most of them are currently pretty bad, but I don't think they'll stay that bad for long. Great, thank you.